In this edition of George Washington Speaks, we will take a deeper look into the role of the Native Americans in the French and Indian War, which is referred to as the Seven Years' War in Europe. In the 1750s, the British colonies continued their expansion westward into the Ohio Valley. That expansion not only conflicted with the areas claimed by the French, but also with the lands that had been the homes and hunting grounds of numerous Native American tribes for centuries. Both groups viewed the colonial incursion as a violation of their rights to the land. The various tribes worked alongside with both the French and the English for a variety of reasons. The Shawnee and Delaware Indians, originally dependents of the Iroquois Confederation, had migrated west from Pennsylvania to the Upper Ohio Valley in the 1720s and 1730s in small groups of families rather than entire villages. Those groups combined with many other tribes which had also been displaced by the colonists and together they formed large villages. Many regarded these villages as the first republics in the Ohio Valley since their councils were made up of representatives from each tribal group. The French continually tried to convince the villages, as well as many other tribes, that the British expansion would ruin their way of life, that they were being cheated out of their land by the colonists, and that they should align themselves with the French, who were their longtime friends. However, the Iroquois Confederation of the Onondaga, Oneida, Seneca, Tuscarora, Mohawk, and Cayuga nations, and to the lesser extents, the Catawba and Cherokee people who moved north from the Carolinas and Georgia fought on the British side. There were several Native American leaders who played a role in the French and Indian War and had an influence on George Washington. In this edition, we will learn about two of them, Queen Alekipa and Tana Carson, a Seneca who was chosen by the Iroquois Confederation to oversee the tribes in the Ohio Valley. Tana Carson was the leader of the Indians in the disputed French territory. I found him to be a smart, clever, and shrewd leader. We first met at Logstown, where he was representing the tribes there, and I and others were representing the colonies. He made it clear to us that his people did not consider that the treaty made 10 years earlier, the Treaty of Lancaster, had given the colonists any land beyond the Allegheny Mountains. But at the same time, he promised that the Iroquois would not interfere with our settlements southeast of the Ohio River. He was part of our first mission to Fort LeBeouf, and he and other Indians helped guide us to the fort through the wilderness. He was also known as the Half King because he held the role of leader of multiple Indian nations in the region. During the Battle of Jaumontville Glen, it was Tanakaris who killed the wounded French general with his tomahawk and took a scalp. He was no friend to the French, but the brutal manner in which he fought them caused some of us to be concerned for our own safety during that first mission. When I was just a small child, the French invaded our village, killed many of our warriors, including my father, and kidnapped many of us to be sold into slavery to another tribe. I rose to become the leader of the Mingos and represented the Six Nations with our dealings with the English. When the French began building their forts in the area of our lands, I sent them diplomatic messages telling them to depart to no avail. So when young Washington and his troops were on their mission uh, to deliver the same message to the French, I and some of my warriors accompanied them as we felt the British would be more sympathetic to our way of life. The French took our land and took our lives and were not to be trusted. Later at the Battle of Fort Necessity, young Washington asked that Tanner Carson and his braves join him in that battle, but the half king refused as he felt it would be a losing battle. And on that measure, he was right. Tanner Carson and the other natives left us alone to fight the French, and that battle ended in our surrender. The French acted as great cowards and the English as fools at Fort Necessity. Young Washington would not heed our wisdom and was too cocksure for someone with limited battle experience. I did not want to put our lives in the hands of such youth, and it was a wise decision to leave Washington and his men to fight the French. 
I took my wife and children east to settle and to leave the French and the English to their own battles. A few years later, I learned of Tana Harrison's death, not, of the de not the death of a great warrior, but the death of an old man. He never took part in any of the war, although his earlier actions against the French are credited today with helping start that conflict. The other native who played a role in young Washington's life was Queen Aliquippa, the leader of the Senecas, who had a short temper and a long memory, as young Washington would soon find out. My first meeting with Washington was under poor circumstances. On his way to deliver a letter to the French, he bypassed our village and did not pay the proper respect to my people or honor to me. On his return, he did pay his respects and made me a gift of a coat and a bottle of spirits, which I enjoyed a great deal. For years, I had been a supporter of the British against the French, and years before, I went with the native people to pay respects to William Penn. My people only wanted our land, peace with the British, and the proper respect for our way of life. If not for me and my influence with my people, things could have turned out quite differently for the English. That's why the English and my people called me Queen. The Queen and her people supported the English cause against the French, but only to a certain point. I recall at Fort Necessity the battle to which I referred to earlier, where we tried to enlist the Indians to fight with us against the French, but they did not. I met young Washington a second time at Fort Necessity, along with my son Kanakshubi and other Mingo warriors. Having learned the proper respect, Washington and his men held a ceremony to thank me for our assistance with them against the British. But I was feeling ill and insisted my son be honored instead. The colonists bestowed the name Colonel Fairfax on my son, which was deemed a great honor and fitting for my son. The old queen left us soon thereafter and moved east to Grohan settlement in Augswich with her family and about a hundred women and children for safety. Here tell a few years later she died well beyond her 80th year but her influence on her people and the colonists lives past her even today. The role of the Native Americans was significant in the lead up to the Seven Years' War, and it should be noted that the influence of Queen Alakipa and Tana Carson on Washington during his early years influenced at least in part his future dealings with the natives as he learned more about their culture and their way of life. Some historians say that the alliance of the natives with the English instead of the French was the key to the winning of the French and Indian War. The terms of the treaty called for the abandonment of the Ohio Valley by the French and ceding a portion of what is now Canada. The French under Napoleon would later sell the remaining territory in North America known as the Louisiana Purchase. American history may have been quite different if not for the role of Queen Alaquipa and Tana Carson. Let's take a look at some discussion questions related to the role of the Native Americans in the battles leading up to the French and Indian War. What do you think George Washington learned about the Native Americans from his meetings with the Queen and Tanache? Some find it unusual that the tribe was led by a woman, especially in the 1750s. What are some of the differences you've seen in how men and women can see things differently? Were Tanache and the Queen wise to abandon Washington at Fort Necessity? What decision would you have made if you were leading the native tribes? <laughs> 